All right, cool. We're going to start uh, going now. So my name is Justin. I work for uh, Delphi Automotive, who's sponsoring the Car Hacking Village. Uh, I run the Red Team Testing Lab there. So my team, who you'll see around here, is the ones that are going to be doing demos and doing a lot of this stuff for us. But we hack our own modules to help our engineers secure them better. So to get into this a little bit, starting off uh, at the Car Hacking Village, we do have a CTF there this year. Um, it's really, really cool. They got lots of different interfaces, lots of different systems to hack into. Um, the first place prize is this truck over here. Um, so if you guys want to play around, you could win a truck. Another prize that we're going to be giving away is this antenna that we're going to be demoing for you guys. So you can see it right here. This is a GPS helical directional antenna. Uh, we'll go into the making of that as well in a little bit. So to, yeah, going back to our day job. So we're a Delphi cybersecurity testing team. We do pen testing for the company, process and tool development, as well as research and development. This is what our facility looks like. We've got a bunch of garage bays we can pull cars into and a pretty big facility to do testing on modules. So now moving into the outline, we're going to talk about uh, different test interfaces on the wireless side as well as toolkits for it just to help you guys out in case you may not have tested or done this stuff before. So we'll just kind of give you the rundown of what we're using and, and what works for us. Then we're going to do a demo on uh, key fob analysis. So we're going to use GNU Radio and a HackRF to do some analysis on key fob to show you how to pull those out of the air and do a uh, deep dive into those. And then we're going to go into building directional antenna, um, which was this guy over here in the front, Brian, who's the mastermind behind that. And then we're going to get into the demo of actually directionally pointing GPS over here and showing you how that antenna works. All right, so now this stuff I'll run through quick because you guys probably know a lot of this. Um, this is just a typical Wi-Fi standards, so I just wanted to throw this in here so you had it all. Um, here's some tools that you guys can use for Wi-Fi. Um, we don't do too much Wi-Fi stuff in cars. I mean, pretty much most of them have WPA2, so in, unless you can bypass the password, which they're getting a little bit better. The car companies are slowly getting better at making good passwords on uh, WPA2, but that's really the only weakness that we're seeing. Um, so yeah, we'll go to the next one, which is going to be Bluetooth. Bluetooth was a lot more vulnerable in the older versions. So any older cars that have older ver uh, versions of Bluetooth in it are extremely vulnerable to those types of attacks. Um, here's some more specs on that. It's another uh, RF spectrum that sits in the 2.4 gigahertz range. Um, the Bluetooth version 5 is really nice because it's bumping up the speed like crazy. And mainly the, whoops, mainly the distance, which is nice, um, just because all these different devices people are making in their houses, um, you can go a lot more farther in your house, but then for us, if we want to do drive-bys, we can also get into their stuff. So here's some tools that we use for Bluetooth testing. The Ubertooth one is really helpful, and then we just use this adapter. It's really easy. We can transmit on this. We can do whatever we want with this device. Some Bluetooth devices won't allow you to. Um, so now moving into cellular, there's three, three different areas that we focus on in cellular. This is just giving you the rundown of spectrums. So whenever we're trying to dig into a new technology or understand it more, this is the type of data we compile to start digging and understanding what tools we want to buy. Um, and then we start reaching out to vendors or coming, coming to events like this and buying all the hacker tools. So when you're getting into a cellular related stuff or any uh, wireless stuff on cars, um, it's recommended to look for this type of content on any of the modules, mainly something with the FCC ID or even an IMEI number. It's going to let you know there's a cell network in here and it's transmitting some kind of RF somewhere. So this is how we quickly can move on to understanding what's coming out of this module. So now looking into the tools that we use, we're um, trying to find what works best for us. So we buy a lot of industry-based tools, like this guy up here. This is from Roden Schwartz. It's a cell site simulator. So this will actually put up a cell tower for you. You put a SIM card in your phone or whatever you need to, and now you can see all the data streams and everything that's going back and forth from that phone. So it's really helpful for us when we're trying to test apps and cars that people are building to understand if they're actually communicating to the server securely and what type of data they're sending back and forth. Um, and then for putting up base stations um, on a cheaper way, you can use a Blade RF with Yates BTS or this USRP device with Yates BTS as well. Those are a little bit cheaper routes to go. And you can have a lot more custom, uh, customizability with those. Um, next is moving on to KeyFob, which we're going to show you the demo on. This is something that was introduced in 1980 by Ford. Um, there's two main frequencies, which is 3.5 megahertz and 33.92 megahertz. Um, the distance is 5 to 20 meters, and the security on this is mainly rolling codes and ch challenge response. A couple years ago, you guys may have seen uh, a guy named Sammy Kamkar create a device that was able to bypass or, you know, 
leverage rolling codes to be able to get into people's cars. Um, there's also passive key entry systems, which are running stuff in the uh, kilohertz range. So when you walk up to your car and you want to unlock it with just your button uh, or the handle on the car, that's usually using something in the kilohertz range. And that's called passive key entry. So here's some tools that we use for uh, the key fob stuff. Uh, we mainly are using the HackRFs, but the spectrum analyzer is really helpful to see those packets coming across. Um, and then we also use the yardstick one because that goes down to the lower kilohertz. So now moving on to GPS, which we'll show you a uh, demo on that as well. This is something that was created by the United States in the 70s. Um, there's a few different bands. The ones that are mainly public are L1 and L2. Uh, if you want to lock down GPS properly, use both radios in your devices. Most people don't. I know Apple doesn't, and we can show you what happens with that because they don't. Um, we we'll pretty much can put anybody's phone wherever we want if you're only using one band, because your phone's only relying on that band, so it's not getting another source to say, hey, you're not actually here, you should be here. Um, so we'll show you what, how that can be messed with. Um, some different tools we're using for this. You can use a HackRF. Uh, they're kind of hard because you've got to stack a bunch because you have to do transmitting and receiving. Um, and then we mainly use the BladeRF, um, which we have set up here connected to this antenna. So we'll show you that in a moment. And then the next one, the last one, which is a fun one, which you guys may not have heard of yet. This is something that's coming in cars. It's kind of scary from my perspective because what they're trying to do with it, but it is something that's needed. Cars do need to talk. If we're going to have autonomous cars down the road, they do have to talk to each other in some manner. So this is currently the automotive solution for that. It's called Vehicle to Everything. Um, it runs just above uh, the 5 gigahertz range, and it has a protocol of 802.11p, which is very similar to all the Wi-Fi standards. It's really not that much different. The biggest thing is uh, it's got this IEEE 1609 application layer on top of it. And then here's some tools that we use for that. Um, if you're looking into development tools, so these are just the hacker type tools besides this one, but another development tool you can look to is something called Coda Wireless or MK5. Um, that'll allow you to actually transmit and do some V2X based stuff. And then another one from the auto industry is pretty big is Vector Canoe. They're really expensive, so hopefully in the near future some hackers will release some tools that are a lot cheaper for you guys. All right, now we can move into this uh, key fob analysis if you're ready, Dave. Hi everybody, my name is Dave Conant. I work for Adelphi along with Justin, and I'm sort of the radio guy, I guess, uh, over there. Okay, so is my screen popping up here? No? How do I... Oh, there we go. That's interesting. Well, if you can't see it, I'm going to have a hard time demoing it. There we go. All right. So who's used GNU Radio before? Anybody in here? Has anybody, for the people who haven't used it, have you heard GNU Radio? Okay. So if you haven't used GNU Radio or you've heard of it, uh, I'm going to explain just the basics of what this thing does. It's a, it's a useful tool that we use in the lab uh, that we use to isolate different wireless signals. So Justin spoke about GPS, you know, DSRC, but at the end of the day, in the radio frequency spectrum, you know, vehicles themselves, they have like 15 different radios on them. Your phone probably has like six or seven. You know, you got Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, but then what about the non-standard wireless? So, I, you know, I've got my key fob here for my truck, for example. Now, this thing doesn't speak Wi-Fi, it doesn't speak GPS. So how do we deal with signals when we don't really have, you know, like a Wi-Fi uh, adapter to, like, just let us authenticate to it. Uh, basically, uh, from the blue, reverse engineering random wireless signals and looking at the binary data uh, inside of them. So I want to show you two tools that we use in the lab uh, to isolate these signals and, and how we can decode the actual binary data uh, off of that so we can actually send and communicate 
with, uh, with these basic devices. It's actually, generally speaking, easier to talk to these guys than something like using Wi-Fi. It's much less complicated. So, for example, with your key fob, it's just a series of bits, and if the car hears that, the right series of bits, there's no handshake. It just says, oh, I like those bits. I'm going to open up the, the car. It's that simple. So as long as you know that code or how to generate that code, uh, then you can talk to it. So actually being able to read the code off of the air if you don't know what the wireless signal looks like is a very useful skill to have in general. Um, DEF CON, we've seen talks that guys talk to satellites using these techniques. You can talk to cars. Uh, anything that transmits a wireless signal that you can talk to. So I'm using a Hack RF. I think the range on this thing in frequency terms is, uh, it goes up to 6 gigahertz and down to 10 megahertz. One megahertz? One megahertz. That's a huge range. Uh, this is actually a monumental invention, software-defined radio in general. Uh, having this kind of power to be able to transmit and receive on that wide a frequency range is something that 10 years ago even would have cost millions of dollars in equipment and would have been military classified type technology. So please get one and learn how to use them. They're very awesome. <laughs> All right. So I'm opening up basically a utility called GQRX. GQRX, if you install GNU Radio along with this, uh, you're going to be covered. So I'm going to move this guy over here. GQRX, this, this guy right here is a spectrum analyzer. Everybody knows what that is? It's our eyes and ears on the frequency, uh, the frequency realm. This lets us see our wireless signals. This guy and most spectrum analyzers cost between mm, at least $10,000 up to $500,000 to a million dollars. Just to give you an idea of what it's like just to see uh, a spectrum range that we're talking about here. Hack RF costs, I think, two or three hundred dollars, and it can see almost the same range as this guy. This, this guy's still better, it's more accurate, but the Hack RF's good enough for us hackers. And GQRX, I want to show you, basically does the same thing that our two hundred thousand dollar spectrum analyzer over here does. And you can actually see they look very similar. And I'm going to use GQRX to move down and find my key fob signal to show you guys what that looks like. I happen to know that it's 315 megahertz. And everything, all your devices, they come with an FCC ID if they're being sold commercially. So they will tell you what the frequency is on the FCC's website. Super useful website to look up all kinds of parameters that we're going to use in GNU Radio to decode this signal. So you can see here when I press my little button for my Hack RF, there's a little bumpity bump coming. That's a frequency shift key coming from my key fob. I do want to show you as well, so we're looking at, I think, uh, what is this, 20 megahertz in bandwidth or 16 megahertz, I can't remember. I do want to show you an important and difficult part in dealing with GNU Radio is setting up the filtering. And I want to show you just what filtering looks like in GQRX. When you click around, you can see that little band there. It's actually filtering all the signals out around it, and if I had my audio on, it would actually play the sound for the, uh, the signal that you're receiving. So you're narrowing in and zeroing in on that signal that you're looking for despite capturing 20 megahertz worth of bandwidth. So a, uh, I think my computer locked up. Yeah, OK. Well, that's OK. I was going to close GQRX anyway and switch to GNU Radio. The important thing to understand is when we're going to decode this signal in GNU Radio and get the binary bits out of there, um, there's basically four steps. And essentially, we have to capture the signal from a source. That's obvious. And then we need to filter all the junk around it out from the signal. And that, there's an entire series, you should watch Michael Osmond's uh, SDR series if you haven't already. It's, uh, Hack R, it's He's the guy who created the Hack RF, and he's got an entire educational video series, and he's got an entire one dedicated, to, uh, an entire hour dedicated to filtering. It's, uh, it's a science and an art. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, there's many different kinds of filters, high pass, low pass, band pass, exflating, fur filters, blah, blah, blah. Uh, learn them all, what they do. Um, they're not that tough, but they're a little intimidating to get to at first. It's very important to zero in on your signal uh, with those filters, though. Okay, 
So once you've zeroed in on your filter and uh, on your signal with your filter, the next step that you have to do is demodulate it. Uh, demodulating is going to come in a couple different flavors. There's frequency demodulation and amplitude demodulation. So when you're playing around in GQRX, it will behoove you to figure out and identify with your eye or your ear whether you're dealing with a frequency shift key signal or an amplitude shift key signal. Amplitude sounds like Morse code or it's changing in volume. A frequency shift key is going to have differing tones that you'll hear and it'll sound more like, uh, like music or dubstep or something like that. So so and once you identify that, you can pick your frequency shift keying or, or your amplitude shift keying. So I've prepared new radio blocks here. Let's see if this works. Is it? No, it doesn't. What's that? Oh, there we go. I'll wait for it for a second. Okay, I have to be fast here. So my program that I've written here, GNU Radio, oh, whoa. It uses flowcharts to define your actual software. In the background of each one of these flowcharts, there's actually a Python script that gets executed. And you can see here, this is what I was talking about. I'm using the Osmocom source, which is my HackRF. I set the frequency to 315 megahertz because I know that that's where my signal is, and I set my sample rate to be about 4 megahertz. That means I'm capturing 4 megahertz of bandwidth around the signal. That's a lot of bandwidth. The actual bandwidth of this signal is like 200 kilohertz. It's not that wide. That's why I pass it into a filter. I'm not going to explain all of these different uh, parameters, but basically I'm zeroing in on the signal with this. So uh, it's kind of offset from 315 megahertz. It's not quite exactly. It's like 314.9. You can figure that out from the FCC website. So I'm offsetting it to zero in on the signal, and then I am shrinking down that 4 megahertz of bandwidth just to capture this signal alone and none of the junk that's uh, flying around it, especially here at DEF CON. I'm then piping the signal into a frequency sync, which is exactly the same thing as the spectrum analyzer that we see here, so we can actually see the signal that we're capturing and confirm that, uh, that we're getting it. Demodulating the signal. And now this is the, the secret sauce to get the binary data out of it. So at this point, this is nice. You'll actually be zeroed in on a signal. You can hear it, you can record it, you can save it, and you can import it into other analysis tools like Baudline and Spectrum, or even Audacity, your favorite music editing program, is able to read uh, this data coming out of here. So you can just put that into a file sync right there. But if you just want to pull the bits out, you put it into a clock recovery, block, the only thing you need to know to use this block is your baud rate of the signal. And you can look at that visually or you can look it up on the FCC. My key is I think 115, uh, 115,000 symbols per second. And once I know that, then I put it into a binary slicer that slices it into bits and I save it to a file on the tempfs. I'm going to show you what that looks like when it runs right now. And I know there's a lot of information. I have a ton of resources for you folks that you can like walk through chapter by chapter. There's a lot of authors out there that have done this exact same thing. And uh, they explain everything in far more detail than I can here today. All right, so I'm going to run the program. Hopefully it'll work. I'm going to click OK. That's fine. All right, there's my signal. And now I'm just going to exit because I've captured what I need. So I save that to temp test. I'm going to go ahead and just dump that with a hexadecimal viewer. And bingo, so you can see the pattern there in the bits. 0, 01, 0, 01, 0, 01 is basically all ones. It's a bunch of, it's a preamble for the signal saying, hey, you're about to receive some interesting data. And right after that, you can see that there's, uh, there's the code right here. Now, something I didn't show you in my block, that if you actually want to use this in the field, is there's something called, uh, there's a way that you can set an access code. So, hey, look for the ones in a row and only capture the bits that come after that. It's useful so you don't get this uh, file that I showed you that has all of the, uh, 
the repeating signal here. It'll just grab the, the, the signal that you're interested in, but just for the purposes of this demo, I wanted to show you the preamble and the code, the preamble and the code, the preamble and the code, and that is literally the key fob signal for my truck. So if somebody wanted to take a picture of those ones and zeros and can find my truck in the parking lot, you could redigitize the signal over the air and break into my truck. And that would be that. Anybody else want to try pressing their unlock key and let me record it and uh, tell me where the make and model and where it's parked? No? It's really cool stuff. That's all I have for you today for my demo, but that's how you decode a binary signal arbitrarily broadcasted over the air. You reverse the entire process to broadcast it out. And uh, please learn how to use GNU Radio GQRX and buy yourself a Hack RF uh, to get into this stuff. And uh, thank you very much. I'll pass it back to Justin. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we gotta flip laptops. I gotta, we gotta flip the laptop again. Open, yeah, pull the HDMI. Sorry, one second. We'll be we, uh, switch the demo stuff up. All right. Now we're gonna get into. Uh, the making of that antenna over there. Whenever the screen wants to load, yeah, one moment. Um, this HDMI. Sorry, guys. All right, here we go. Nope, no source found. Sorry, I it's I have it set up to duplicate. It looks like it's not really going in. Looks like it wasn't filling in. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, no, it's HDMI. Actually, sure, we can try it. Up, oh, all right, never mind. We'll try this. If not, then I'll try this little dongle. There we go, sweetness. Sorry about the delay, guys. All right, so now we're going to get into uh, building a helical antenna. So this is going to be presented by Brian Gillespie. This guy's a badass physics guy. He knows a lot of stuff in physics, and now he's becoming a hacker. So here you go. Here's Brian. All right. All right. Thank you, Justin. Um, are you going to index the slides since you, uh, oh, yes, since you took? OK, so um, can I just review some, some of the fundamentals of, the, of radio physics ways, as most of you probably know. But we need to understand that with more building things like this and, and uh, doing things that Dave's doing and other people. So, so the quick review. So here's our whole uh, our spectrum of uh, that we have. You know, uh, increasing uh, wavelength. Uh, we get have the lower frequency, and then we have uh, higher frequency, smaller smaller wavelengths. And if you see where I've got that arrow pointed, r radio frequencies are typically uh, frequencies above one gigahertz or ten to the nine hertz, um, and they travel at the speed of light. And so we go to the next slide here. Uh, so they travel in a straight line and they reflect. So when you're above that uh, frequency range, they'll bounce off uh, things like the walls. When you have the lower frequencies, you can have um, environmental effects on them. But for what we're doing, you know, the travel's at the speed of light. And it's important to remember our wave equation here where we have, uh, you know, the, the, frequency, the frequency times the wavelength gives us the speed. So that's going to be helpful when I build the antenna. 
and forward. So helical antenna. This is what the main part of the talk here is. So, uh, well, backwards. So <clears throat> you got your center, your your center support here, which is uh, which is this uh, B here, and you can see that the antenna over there, uh, the coaxial feed line. And then you have the insulating supports because we don't want any uh, conductivity anywhere else. You got the reflector uh, ground plane, and then um, you got your um, coaxial that uh, feeds your signal in, or or if you want to uh, receive, then it goes the other way. So there's two modes that these helical antennas can uh, operate in, and that's the normal mode, uh, where the uh, helix pitch and diameter are small compared to the wavelength, and are omnidirectional, and then the actual mold type, end fire, which is what that antenna over here is, is um, the diameter and the pitch are comparable to the wavelength. And you'll see that when I'm going to uh, show up here next, or coming up. <clears throat> so this is just kind of a visual, what it looks like from some simulations between an omnidirectional type antenna, which just kind of radiates out and spreads out, where the end fire directional, which is the helical, which means we can point it at things, is, is, is this one here. Here's a little more uh, animation here for us just to show uh, what happens when we have a helical antenna and that is depending on which way the helix is oriented we uh, the waves will spin uh, one way or the vectors here will show the polarization it will be right-handed or left-handed and so that's based on how this uh, which way that's turned now I don't know uh, you took the animation out it looks like that's okay but you can see down here, as it comes out, these waves are, are spinning around. That's the representation up here, and that's the end fire for that. Okay, so this gets to the heart of the matter here of how to make the antenna. So I found this web, web, nice website up here that did, did most of the calculations for us. Um, so you plug in the uh, frequency, how many turns you want, and then it pops out all this information that we need to build the antenna. So this is the general schematics that I, we had to, I had to take and interpret to uh, you know, build that antenna that's sitting over there uh, so that we can use it for our work and uh, looking at what happens when we uh, GPS is pointed at something that is, has it and what impact it's going to have for us. All right. Whoops, wrong button. Okay. So real quick, take some tools to build that and some design work from, from the previous slide to make all these parts here. So this is our, our bridge apart mill that I was using. Uh, I was in the process of putting in the holes. All these holes are spaced, based on fractions of the of wavelength on that, from that slide I uh, showed you before. So that tells me what the spacing needs to be here. And then uh, from there, you need to use the lathe to make some of the other round parts. Basically, that items you need. And one thing that I'm remember that an antenna is just a wire. So all that is is just a wire configured a certain way to get the frequency we need uh, for this application. And some plastic, some aluminum, and other tools. All right, so there's the, oops, backwards. There's the antenna, and I think we're ready for the demo. So this is some things we're doing in the lab here. So you can see we're getting the signal. We've got a Blade RF. Nick over there has got us all set up. Some of you, he's been broadcasting that for the whole time. So depending on your device, it could show you that it might be 1,000 feet above Moscow. So if he points it over here, let me get out of the way, you should see the signal get, get stronger as he points it over here. And that's the purpose of it. Now, if you put your hand in front of it, now see it's bouncing off the wall. Put your hand in front of it when you turn it over there, because I checked it earlier. See, it's now, it's now, because it's reflecting off the wall, like I was mentioning, because it behaves like light. So it'll just bounce off the wall. So, and that's, uh, that's everything. It was, a, it was a common issue we were having in the lab, was like we were tilting. We're like, this thing's not working. Here, sorry. We're like, this thing's not working. But then we're like, oh, yeah, reflection, light. It's just light. So, that's why if you do, I don't think this is going to go the whole way, but if you do that and put your hand in front of it, it's going to put it away because now it's, it can't reflect off the walls anymore. But if you do this, now it's starting to reflect off the, law, the walls in the room and the ceiling just like light does. Um, another thing too, we don't have the amp plugged in on this, so we're not giving it enough power. We could pump this thing, or here, I'll let Nick talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. With proper ampl amplification, you can cover this entire casino in whatever signal you want. This will render all navigation GPS completely useless. You'll be wherever I tell you you are. 
Yeah. So pretty scary stuff, especially with autonomous cars coming down the road. Um, obviously, we care about safety a lot, which is why we design stuff like this. So we're not just putting everybody in the whole entire place in Moscow. Um, we're just putting everything that's directional over there. Um, it's a safer way of doing tests like this. Um, you know, you don't really want to get FCC calls. Um, so doing stuff like this and having the proper facility to do this stuff in is, is also really helpful. The lab we do all this testing in is pretty much a Faraday cage. We don't have cell inside the building. We can't get anything in or out. So we know the tests that we're doing inside are not affecting systems externally from our lab. So yeah, that's about it. Um, if you guys want to get into cars, we'll be here the whole entire time during DEF CON. We do, we're a part of the CTF, so we'll, we have some stuff over there you guys can hack into, try to find some flags, and maybe win that Jeep or that truck or uh, this antenna. So yeah, thank you guys for coming out, and uh, enjoy the con. We got a question for you. We're doing questions now. I, I realize we do have some extra time. Re, uh, he said it was about with, without using both L1 and L2 to lock down the OG. Yes, you know how it's. Uh, how do you push someone into Moscow? So if you're using both L1 and L2, that would stop an attack like this uh, from a skid if they were doing one radio. You can sync two radios, broadcast L1 and L2 for the correct position, but it requires manual math or a very well written program. Um, what you would see with both receivers is you would see that L2 is getting where you would expect, where L1 is not. And L2, if they broadcast, there's no open source GitHub project for that yet, um, but I'm going to post it. Um, you would be able to tell also by the difference in timing. So we need less than five parts per million accuracy to be, or precision to be able to get this to be received by your phones or any other consumer grade device. It is very unlikely for someone to be able to do the wiring correctly to get that kind of accuracy to be consistent through two radios at the exact same time. So that's a good stop for this type of uh, attack. Great question. Any other questions? Yep, we'll go with you in the red first. So with this attack, the question was, uh, could we impact timing? The answer is yes. Uh, whatever time I broadcast, um, it, it, you kind of need to know more about the, the packet that gets broadcast from the satellite. But basically, it's, it's its latitude, longitude, and its time of broadcast. And then your radio takes in all those signals it picks up and says, ah, I see the time of flight was so and so, therefore I'm here. So if I were to broadcast consistently a different time, yes, you would receive it and trust it. It's a very uh, weird phenomenon, but people do it. They use their GPS as timers. Uh, <laughs> with your RSA certificates, uh, time is usually a factor in that, and you can completely set the seed value for a lot of these embedded controllers because they'll generate the same certificate given the same time. So if you know what it was once, you can just tell it it's the same time over and over again, and all of a sudden you're able to get the same certificate all the time which means now you can man in the middle, even if they rotate their certs. Funky little CS problems become very big security holes. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah. Uh, just generally, when you take a look at a car, like what do you, when you start going after, like how do you... Here's a so that's a good question. Um, we don't directly focus on the full vehicle yet. Uh, we're mainly focused on modules. So if you guys don't know what Delphi does, they create a lot of the safety uh, systems in your con uh, cars as well as infotainment systems in your vehicles. Um, so right now our focus is strictly on protecting our parts. Um, down the road we do want to have uh, offerings to like our customers, OEMs, where we could do full vehicle assessments for them. But right now it's strictly on the um, module side. I did a talk um, a few months ago at SANS that kind of laid out a lot of this stuff. I can get you that link and there's a presentation in there that'll show you more details of what we did for that. Yep. Uh, we do, yes. And we also focus, uh, sorry, the question was um, are we only focusing on like our ECUs or the interfaces that are coming in from other stuff? Uh, and the answer is absolutely the stuff that's coming from other systems. And that's why even the wireless stuff, you know, when stuff's coming over wireless, we're testing that. We don't only look inside our systems, we look on the interfaces and anything that's connecting to the systems. Um, a lot of that's hard to test when you only have the module because you don't know how everything's going to be talking to it. So that's why we're trying to build our systems up to eventually do full vehicle assessments. So, good question. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, cool. We'll talk later. <laughs> any other questions? All right, if you guys have any, just ask, or if not, just stop by our booth. Uh, thanks again.